John Gart Robinson was raised on Grand Island, New York, just a few miles upstream from majestic Niagara Falls. His love of reading was handed down from his father, who named him after the hero of High Ranch epic, Atlas Strug. Growing up, John enjoyed sailing with his family. Additionally, he raced his own sailboat and crewed for other sailors on Lake Erie and the Niagara River. During high school, he competed in football, swimming, and lacrosse. John began attending college at Georgia Tech as part of the Navy ROTC program. He finished his undergraduate degree at University of Buffalo in sport medicine and began a career as an athletic trainer after an ankle fracture medically disqualified him for military service. After earning his master's degree, John and his family relocated to Middle Tennessee, where he continued working as an athletic trainer, providing care for several high school athletic programs. A few years later, he took a big risk and enrolled in medical school at East Tennessee State University. After earning his medical degree, John and his family moved to Columbia, South Carolina, where he began residency in emergency medicine. They continue to live there today when practices in a large regional hospital emergency department. And on today's episode of Auto Interview, it's my utmost pleasure and joy to have on the show today, John Robinson. Welcome on the show, John. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's so wholesome to have you on the show today. I'm excited. So am I. Yeah. So, John, let's start with your thriller novel, because I see that you have quite a lot of books out there that we are going to mention and talk about some today. So I'd love to start with your thriller novel in the title of Forces of Redemption. And I'd love to Mm -hmm. ask you, how does this book come about? What inspired you to write Forces of Redemption? Okay. Well, this is the the one you're talking about here. Yeah. And I've always been a avid reader uh, ever since probably middle school when I got turned on to reading in, in, in classes. Uh, and I've always read uh, all the way up through today, still an avid reader, but uh, my wife and my younger daughter, both are avid readers as well. And at some point, probably about 10 years ago, they both started telling me I should write novels. And I used to laugh mm. at that and in high school. <laughs> you know, I was an athlete. I was a math and science person. I work in a math and science profession, and even though I enjoy reading, writing was never my thing. In fact, you know, for the English teacher assigned a hundred word essay, I would cringe. I didn't want to write that. Uh, And, you know, you write poetry. I couldn't imagine writing poetry. So writing never even occurred to me, but they started telling me I should write. And at first I kind of scoffed and probably as a year went on, I started warming up to the idea. I was like, oh, that might be fun to do. And Mm. Uh, then I started thinking about it some more and I said, like, well, if I wrote, it would have to be in a thriller genre. Cause that's what I like to read. I'd want to write what I want to read, wow. but you know, there's so many good authors out there. You know, I grew up with Tom Clancy and, uh, later got turned on to Vince Flynn and there's so many, so many others, Alistair McLean and mm-hmm. now Jack Carr and Ryan Stack and Andrews and Wilson, so many, and so many. they've all covered so many great topics. And I just don't, I didn't want to just re- reproduce what somebody else has already done kind of mm. carbon copy the story change the names uh, so i couldn't come up with anything original or unique and you know i've always thought if you think of the great literary series the great movies the great television programs it's always the characters it's not so much the topic it's the characters yeah, and absolutely. that was the other thing is what characters would i come up with and mm. um, i even got to the point that i really started mulling it over and i would think about it i would pray about it and kind of put it on the back burner and forget about it and go about everything else I was doing. And uh, July of 2018, you can ask my wife at four o'clock in the morning, I woke up from a dream and I had the first book in my head. I mean, vividly in my head, the characters, I could picture them, the the rough outline of the story. And I went into this room right here, my little study, and I pulled out a legal pad and I wrote it all out. I wrote little bits about the characters and the story and, I prayed about it and went back to bed. The next day I looked at it again. I was like, yeah, I can do this. And I, it just took a lot of research. And that first one took me a year and a half to write, but mm. um, I, I did it. <laughs> and wow. now I'm hooked and I, I don't want to stop. Wow. 
That's so amazing to know. And I love your start. I love your inspiration. And I love your Genesis yeah, with writing. Sounds very amazing to me. That's very amazing. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Now, you also have another book in the name of Power City. For readers yes. who haven't read it yet, and of course, without giving much information away, could we have a sneak of what we'll expect picking up Power City? Beautiful cover, too. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Power City is, this is all part of a series. It's my my two main characters are Joe Shannock, he's a Navy SEAL, and Dr. Christy Tabrizi, she's an ER physician. And so they will meet in the first book, Enforces of Redemption. And then it looks like we're probably getting a reverse image of that, and I apologize. Wow. Um, but or you might be getting the full image. But Power City, as you can see, takes mm-hmm. place in Niagara Falls, New York, uh, right where I grew up. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but basically uh, there used to be a very strong organized crime presence in Niagara Falls, New York. Uh, it has largely gone away just due to the change in the economic climate and different laws and everything. But in this one, they're resurging and they're leaving a lot of crime in their path, a lot of uh, drug addiction, prostitution, people getting killed. Mm-hmm. And they personally go after my main character. Um, and that's it just it took a life of its own out of the first book and it's probably still my sentimental favorite of all the books i've written mm. uh it was oh. going back home and it gives the reader uh a little tour of the water of niagara falls itself of the western new york area buffalo the niagara river which is just one of the most beautiful places in the world especially in the summertime Mm. Uh, and it's, it was just so much fun to write. And a lot of the minor characters are based on real people that I grew up with. And um, I I wrote that one in six months. I just couldn't stop. I, I just wow. the book was so fresh in my head. And it was the same thing. I woke up from a dream. Um, I was having a <laughs> I was taking a nap while I was wow. querying the first novel. I'd sent query letters out to every literary agent in the United States and Canada. And I was starting on Great Britain that uh, agents that handle my genre. And I just gotten tired. It was July and I laid down, I took a nap and I woke up and there was the uh, the idea for the second book, at least the beginning of the second book. I'm like, wow, what if this happened? And the story just grew out of that. Well, I like the thought that most of this writing are inspired by one dream or the other. <laughs> so yeah. It's amazing, really. And yeah, I, I love well, the that. first two. I love that, actually, because I've written some some works when I just you know, wake up from a dream someday and just... Yeah got an inspiration. I said, oh, wow, this is amazing. Or even have a writing inspired a particular dream I mm-hmm. had. So I don't know. It's amazing to hear that from you too, even as a novelist. looks amazing. Well, it's it, the first two, definitely they were dreams. So all I could say is I wow. am not creative enough to come up with these ideas. It can only be <laughs> wow. it, it couldn't be me. Uh, the rest of them have wow. taken a life from that. Uh, you, mm. know, you can always take current events. You can just open up a newspaper and find something to write a story about. And some of my favorite authors do that. Mm. Uh, I just, this series keeps continuing on and I'm as excited to see where my characters are going to go next. They're like real people to me. I have a lot of fun. It's literally, you're hanging out with them when you're writing. And so, you know, I just, I have all of these different visions of what they're going to do next and wow. these different exciting things they're going to get involved with. So now it's really taking a life of its own. Wow. That's very amazing to know. Very amazing to know Thank all you. this. I'm quite shocked and, you know, excited at the same time hearing that from you. More reason why I love to consider writing a spiritual journey. So, yeah, that's, yeah. that's very amazing to know. Thank you. Yeah. Now, John, you know, as authors, we all have different ways of reacting to feedbacks and criticism of our works. I'm curious mm-hmm. to know your opinion about criticism. How do you undo criticism as a writer, especially the negative ones? Well, in all honesty, I actually ask for criticism. And especially with the first novel, I sent it out to a handful of people that I trusted Mm. um, that I knew would give me honest opinions. And they were avid readers themselves. And I just wanted their opinion as a reader. Is this something you would enjoy reading? If so, let me know what you like about it. What don't you like about it? What do you think could be improved? Uh, you know, I'm not trained to be an author. I, the only training mm-hmm. I had was being a reader and just enjoying it. Uh, so especially with the first novel, I really brought no skills. I just wrote what I would want to read, period. And uh-huh. now that I've been doing this for a while, I've actually been learning the craft of writing. I've been uh, working with uh, 
an editor who's very well placed in the field and is very knowledgeable about this. I've uh, been l- listening to podcasts about writing and I realize there's a lot of subtleties that go into writing to make a novel better, to make a, a, a story really pop with the readers. Mm. And there's many things I can improve on. And so the criticism is actually helpful, especially for people that are knowledgeable about this. I just want to get better. I want to take a what I think is a great story and make it an outstanding story. So I'm good with criticism. Now, you know, there's always going to be some people that are like, well, I don't like that he writes about this. Yeah. Uh, you know, my models have my, my novels have a subtle faith component in it. They're meant to entertain, they're meant to inspire, and they're written for a broad audience. Whether you're a full-blown atheist, I still think you'll enjoy the novels. Oh. Because I don't flood it with faith element, but one of my characters has a faith background, and so there's little bits of that in there. And mm. uh, I, I've talked to many people who you know, have no religious ideology whatsoever, and they still enjoy the novels. Mm. But once in a while, somebody will like, they don't want to hear it at all. Uh, mm. So sometimes that I'm not going to say it's just not for everybody. You know, I, there's many novels I've read that I didn't enjoy and yeah. we all like different things. We have our own different circles that we enjoy. Uh, and if people don't like it, that's fine. There's, yeah. we all like different music. Absolutely. You know? and that's fine. They don't have to like it. I don't have any <laughs> expectations. I'm honored. Somebody would even give my work a try. And if they don't like it, that's good. But if, mm. if they find something constructive to criticize let me hear it you know mm-hmm. if they're like you know you could word this better or uh you know the opening chapter just didn't capture me well let me know because that's only going to make the next novel better yeah wow i love your take on criticism it sounds very amazing and quite educative to me so yeah thank you for sharing thank you yeah now john you know i've always been fascinated about our authors and I think I mentioned this while, it, while we even came up Fox time with the interview. Mm-hmm. I've always been fascinated about our authors, especially novelists like yourself, craft long sentences and bring words together in a way that it eventually makes a great novel. You know, these often leave me thinking about how exactly they got their ideas and inspiration. Now, as far as writing is concerned, I too would love to ask you, how do you get your inspiration and ideas? Where did they come from? Well, as I said before, when I was first thinking about the first book, I would mull it over. I would even pray about it, but uh, I just didn't, I I was hitting a brick wall and literally the first book came to me in a dream. The second one very much so as well. Uh, But now it's a continuation of that. Like I said, it's taken a life of its own, Mm. Um, but there's not a day goes by, you know, I'm, I'm a man of faith. There's not a day goes by that I don't start my writing with prayer first and just ask wow. God to inspire. That's I don't think amazing. I can do this on my own. And wow. that's how God works. If you read the Bible, David was the king. Daniel was looking to anoint a king from David's family. David was left out in the, in the fields. His father mm. didn't even consider David worthy of bringing before Samuel. Mm. God always takes the least likely people. And I am not, yeah. I was, I'm the, if People thought I was ever going to be an author. They'd have been nuts. And same with being a doctor. Nobody I grew up with would have thought I'd been a doctor. So mm. God can do anything with anybody. You Absolutely. just have to be willing. Well. So I'd say that's where it comes from. Um, but at the same time, I still write what I would want to read. It's like, what would be a fun story? What's something I would want to sit down and read? What's something I want to explore? I think novels are a great way to explore different places, different locations, yeah. uh, relevant current events. Uh I, I've always been a big fan of Tom Clancy because you're reading a page turning novel and you're learning at the same time. And so I don't write completely like him. I'm not nearly as wordy, but I do like to bring along some information along the way or historical relevance or maybe explain a little bit about something going on medically or mm. uh, militarily with my Navy SEALs. Uh, but without getting dragged down and, and making the story come to a complete halt. Um, wow. Well, wow, that's Does that make am- sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's quite amazing. I love I love the motivation imbibed in your answer to this particular question. It's quite motivating. Yeah. I I love it. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Now, could you also tell Lux a bit about the making of your other book titled Lost Angels? Yes. That's this one right here. So this is the third one in the story. And 
you know, my first novel, Forces of Redemption, dealt with uh, the Central American cartels and human trafficking. Wow. And the second one was dealing more with organized crime. But the third one really gets back into the human trafficking element. Um, that's something that's been on my heart for a long time. As an emergency room physician, I have seen patients that have been victims of tra trafficking. And sadly, I've probably missed many I, that I may have been able to intervene in. And uh, awareness is a big issue. And I'm not doing this to be socially aware. That's not the purpose of these novels. They're still meant to entertain. Mm. Uh, but this one really delves into uh, a, a Russian organized crime unit in Atlanta that is abducting pretty young girls off of college campuses and then auctioning them off online. And, you know, these things really happen. I've done a ton of research on this. I work with several organizations that help rescue women out of human trafficking. And what my novels cover doesn't even scratch the surface of how horrible it really is. Mm. Uh, so that was kind of where that story went. Uh, and it's a natural extension for my two characters. They just kind of stumbled along the program. And, uh, you know, Joe and Christy and Joe's right hand man, his sidekick, Matt Ramsey, uh, they don't ever back out of a fight. If they see a problem, they're going to jump in and they're going to help people. That's just the kind of oh. people they are. And that's where the story grew out of. Wow, that's quite lovely to know. I love the sound of Lost Angels. Sounds pretty much amazing to me. And I was going to ask you, what genre is it too? Is it also a thriller novel? Yes, these are all suspense thrillers. Beautiful. Um, like I said, my two main characters are Joe Shanakis and Navy SEAL. So there's always a little bit of Navy special warfare, or at least the skills oh. that he has. Uh, you know, when I crafted his character, I you, you always need an inspirational character. Uh, but wow. somebody who also has skills and special abilities. And in my personal opinion, Navy SEALs are incredibly well-trained. They are incredibly skilled. They're very inspirational. To mm. become what they are, they have to be a special breed of person. Very, very few people even get the chance to go through SEAL training. And only mm. about 10% of them make it through. So they're exceptional to begin wow. with. They're about the closest thing to uh, superheroes you can get. And uh, they're incredibly intelligent. And they can reason their way out of a bad situation and uh, they can find a way to win and that's one of their models is wow. models is finding a way to win so it makes for a great character um and same thing with christy tabrizi and she's just a mama bear physician she's a just a warrior in many ways as wow. you'll discover her in the books but She's also very kind and gentle and just, you know, somebody you would want to be around. And that's kind of what inspires the writing. It's, these are people I'd love to hang around and I'd love to mm. go on these journeys with them. Wow. That's amazing to know. Amazing to know. And I love your take on characterization, which is one of the integral parts of storytelling. One of the things that to me captivates me the most when it comes to writing or reading a novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you for sharing now, John, apart from the titles I've mentioned thus far, do you have any other works mm -hmm. you've authored or maybe currently working on? Yes, I have actually. This one's published. This is called In Darkness, Darkness Light, Shines. Light Shines. Beautiful title. And this is, this is the fourth novel in the series. And this is a little bit more of a political thriller, actually. So it's a little bit of a change for me. Mm. Uh, there's uh, a couple of villains that have been in the past books that show up and really rear their ugly heads this time and some bad things happen. In fact, the end of lost angels uh, will leave people hanging a bit. And this one picks up right where it's at, which that's kind of a funny story in itself. I had finished lost angels and I had two endings for it. One was a happy ending and one was a cliffhanger. And I had my beta readers look it over and I, sh I gave them both endings and they're like, Oh, you definitely have to do the second one. So I left the readers <laughs> hanging a little bit, which is yeah. kind of an unwritten rule. You're not supposed to do that. There was still a conclusion to the book, but it made you immediately want to read the next book. Mm. And so the very next day, I started researching, writing the next one and with a plan to get it out as quick as possible. And I had it written in six months and then it took seven months to get published. <laughs> so a lot Whoa. of people are asking, when's, when's the next one coming out? Um, but uh, that one came out last year. And since then, I've finished the fifth book of the series. That one's called The Harvest. And that one, uh, there's still some Navy special warfare in it, but there's also a bit of a medical mystery in this one. So I, wow. I like to kind of move the themes around a little bit. Uh, and that one is going through revision right now. Hopefully that one's going to be out in a couple of months. Wow. In the meantime, I'm 
15,000 words as of last night into the sixth book of the series. That one's going to be called Silent Victors. And that oh. one's a bit more of a, a Navy military thriller. Uh, and that one, the commanding officer and the three department heads of a nuclear ballistic missile submarine get kidnapped. And the Navy's job is to try to get out there and find them and get them back because they know these people possess a lot of nuclear secrets. They suspect the Chinese are involved. And so they dispatch, they through the CIA, they figure out where they're being held and they dispatch a team of Navy SEALs to go rescue them, but it's in Chinese held waters. Mm. And they have to get delivered by another submarine, the USS Indiana, which I actually had the pleasure of going aboard out to sea back in the May. Uh, mm. And so this submarine will be delivering the SEALs, but things will go sideways and it'll turn into a real... Um, high stakes, high tension adventure very quickly. Uh, wow. And I'm having a lot of fun writing that one. I've got a lot of people helping me, a lot of very well-placed people in the Navy, very knowledgeable, um, many years in the submarine and intelligence community that have been really pitching in to help me write this one. And it's it's been a lot of fun. And uh, wow. I also have a new series started. Uh, I'm working with wow. a new editor and we're trying to query agents again for the new series. Uh, this one's going to be more of a domestic thriller. The first book right now, the working title is called Odin's Spear, and that's uh, regarding uh, an outlaw motorcycle club. That and, and let me paraphr- let me stop. Most, even the one percent motorcycle clubs are not true outlaws. Um, they just mm. you know live their own life, but they don't really bother anybody. They're not involved in organized crime like we see in the movies. Uh, but there are a few that are, and in this is a fictional motorcycle club, but they're. They have drugs, gun running, prostitution, um, and they pretty much run the Southeast. And Mm. um, my main character in this one is a former Navy SEAL who is now an emergency room physician. And he has a a troubled past and he's kind of reclusive and withdrawn to himself. And a nurse he meets has a very similar background. Uh, She basically... Oh, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but uh, <laughs> they get tied up with this motorcycle club in a in a really bad situation. And it he has to kind of come out of his shell and recall his past days as a Navy SEAL and re- re- rely on a few friends from his past days. And mm. um, it just turns into another page turner from there. And I'm Whoa. writing the sequel to that one as we speak as well. Wow. Wow. You, it, it's obvious you've got so many works ongoing, so many titles ongoing, <laughs> so many impressive works ongoing. That's a lot, yeah. really. That's really a lot. I need to commend you for that. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's amazing. It's, it's an amazing it's, skill. It's a lot of fun. I Like I said, I don't think I'm the most skilled person to be bringing this, <laughs> but you know, it, it's worked out and I, I'm enjoying the ride. Uh, I have many more other ideas for stories. Wow. I have one that's kind of a spinoff of my first series uh, that a former classmate of mine, uh, I would love to get with her and write the story. It's about her family when they escaped from Vietnam in 1978. Wow. It's an amazing story. Wow. They made it across the South China Sea in a little tiny wooden boat, 800 miles to escape the communist Vietnam regime and they were one of the few families that survived it and uh her story is amazing I think it should be made oh. into a, a novel and I would love to write oh. that story one day um but um, I can only do so much at one time wow that's quite lovely to know thank you so much for sharing all of this sounds very thank amazing you. to me now could you tell thank us you. what publishing is like for a published author like yourself are there any challenges you've encountered ever since it got published Yes, publishing is the biggest. Uh, there's in this day and age, it's easier to be. Pu- you can self-publish now in the days yeah. of Amazon. Unlike, you know, even 30, 40 years ago, that was not the way. Uh, the traditional route is you need to take your work, your manuscript, to a literary agent. That's what when I said querying earlier. That's what that is. You query a literary agent, and if they're interested in your work, they will ask for the full manuscript. And if they like it, and they think it's capable of being published they Mm. will sign you and Mm. then you work with that agent and they take your work to various publishers to try to get it published there's no guarantees yeah uh, but that's what they try to do but they know the publishers uh but you can't go directly to a publisher the publisher won't listen to me 
The publisher mm-hmm. will listen to an agent that they know and trust. Yeah. Uh, so I have to get in with that agent. And that's the hardest part uh, is really querying the agent. I have not been with an agent yet. I said, in this day and age, you can self-publish. I'm not self-published. I've been working with a small publishing firm called KCM Publishing. Uh, mm-hmm. They've published my first four novels. Um, and that's what's called boutique publishing. Uh, they basically do the copywriting, the editing, and a lot of the work for you and help get your novels up. And so my novels are out available to the public. They're on Kindle ebook, they're on Amazon. Um, and they know that how to wade through the process for you and they help you with that. Mm. Uh, but it's not like being with one of the big traditional publishers that can mass produce your books. They can mm. put them into bookstores. They can market for you. That's a whole nother level entirely. That's who you're, Tom Clancy's and your Jack Carr and Ryan Steck and Andrews and Wilson, they're with publishers like that. Wow. Um, that's ultimately the goal. Uh, I think personally, that's that's the goal for just about every author. Some are happy self-publishing yeah. uh, because they have complete control over everything. You know, when you do, if you do sign with a publisher, you lose some of your control over that. Um, yeah. You know, and then you're on timelines, and there's requir- there's more requirements of you and everything. But, Absolutely. Um, I think, by and large, the majority of people that write, they're not trying to get into it for fame and fortune. That's certainly not what I'm after. Mm. But at the same time, when you put the time in and you write what you think is a good work, you yeah. want it to be read by a lot of people. You want Absolutely. you want it to be well received. Yeah. And it's very hard to do that when you're with a, a small publisher or if you're self publishing. Uh, but that may be where you have to start is on your own and then really learn your craft and then get to the point that you can re-query, which is where I'm at now. I think I've gotten to a point that it's it's a good opportunity or a good time to start a new series and query with a new agent and see where this leads. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I so much love your take on this. Sounds very amazing to me and quite illustrative, informative as well. So thank you for sharing. Now, John, is there anything that you would love to share with the viewers about your books that we did not mention in this interview and you'd love the viewers to know? Also, as a published author, what sort of advice do you offer for the writers who are still struggling with publishing a book? What would you advise people in this category? Sure. Uh, as far as my books go, uh, yes, I'm a man of faith, um, but my books do not hit you over the head with faith. There's little bits <laughs> trickled in here and there, but my books are meant to be enjoyed by everybody. They're meant to entertain. Yeah. They're meant to inspire. And so they're written that I think even the, a hardcore atheist skeptic uh, mm. would enjoy them and not Love feel that. like I'm trying to preach at them or anything else. In fact, Joe O'Shanick, my main character, he's an agnostic. So they have somebody mm. they can relate to. He's a likable person. A very inspirational, amazing character, but he's an agnostic. So they have somebody they can relate to, whereas Christy Tabrizi, she's a Christian. Um, mm. But that doesn't really control the story. It's just that's who they are. And occasionally uh, there's little snippets of conversation that might bring up a little bit of a faith element, but that's pretty much it. They're mm. meant for people to enjoy. So I don't want to uh, box myself into Christian literature uh, mm. or Christian fiction, even though, yes, technically I am, but it's what I call subtle Christian fiction. It's meant for a wide readership. Uh, my characters would appeal to male and female readers. In fact, I think I have more female readers than male right now. Wow. Uh, and they're they're very likable, inspiring characters. They're, wow. and, and they're very clean. I don't have any profanity in my novels. Uh, I deal with some very dark topics like the cartels, human trafficking. Mm. Uh, there are some very rough topic matter to cover uh but i try not to do it in a gratuitous way people know what's happening but they don't have to visualize every horrific component of it absolutely uh, and then to the to the second question to new people don't give up i i think the best example is well tom clancy's one he wrote the hunt for Red october which was a blockbuster novel but he couldn't get anybody to even look at it and finally uh nav press gave him a small advance and uh, published it and it went huge and you just never know in mm. uh, JK Rowling's another one she was rejected multiple times but the so, Harry Potter series has become one of the biggest umpires out there as has Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan universe mm. uh, so I would say don't give up I'm not giving up I'm, I'm not where I would like to be 
Uh, but I won't stop writing. I won't stop learning about the craft. And mm. uh, you know, you fail your way to success. You, Absolutely. If you hit success right out of the box, that's a rare Love person. But the majority of people are going to fail their way to success. They're going to deal with rejection. And it's, you know, it, the person that's willing to get up off the mat, if they're getting knocked down, that's the person that's going to persevere. And just like my Navy SEAL characters, they made it through SEAL training by refusing to quit. You know, and they're beaten down, they're deprived, they are frozen for 27 weeks, and oh. it done, everything is done to them to try to make them quit. And it's mm. those few 10% who refuse to quit that become Navy SEALs. And I think that applies to anything we do in life. You know, mm. you may fail the first time, doesn't mean you can't this, the next time. Absolutely. Wow. I love your advice really so much. Thank and you. I love the words you. that you said, you feel your way to sources. That sounds very amazing and very poetic, as well as idiomatic. You know, it's wholesome. It's wholesome, and it's actually reality. So thank you so much for your advice. And I'm hopeful that viewers, including myself, would love to utilize it. So, John, in case we have some viewers who are currently watching this interview, I would love to get a copy of any of your books. On what platform are they available on for purchase? Okay. Uh, I am on Amazon. My books are available in print. They're also on Kindle as well as Kindle Unlimited. Uh, they can also be bought in bookstores. Uh, bookstores can order them through Ingram. Uh, but again, I'm not with a major publisher, so the bookstores would have to order them if they're requested. But if you go on Amazon, they're right there. My author name is, oh, let me get the largest print one, is John Galt God Robinson. Robinson. Yeah, that's G-A-L-T. Uh, if you go on Amazon and type that in, my novels will come right up. I also have a website under construction. It's www.johngaltrobinson.com. And currently right now, it will land you on my Amazon page. Uh, but eventually, it's going to have a lot of other features to it. Uh, we'll even have a store right on the page where on the website uh, where you can purchase signed copies from me directly. Uh, oh. And many other things, updates, reader email lists, and that kind of thing. But uh, we're still under construction for that right now. I'm on Facebook. I'm on X, formerly known as Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Uh, so there's different ways to get a hold of me. And uh, my email is on my website. It's john at johngaltrobinson.com. And just like I said before, I welcome the feedback, good or bad. Mm. If you've read my novels and there's something you like or something that troubled you, reach out to me. I love hearing from readers. Yeah. Um, if you want to know more about them before you purchase them, same thing. Reach out to me. I love hearing from readers. That's amazing. That's really amazing. And I left a link in the description part of this interview where interested viewers can get a copy of John Robinson's books directly on Amazon and also via the other platform. So thank you so much, John, for accepting the invitation to be featured on P English Literature. It's awesome having this conversation with you. Appreciate you having me on. It's been an honor. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, it's a pleasure as well. Thank you.